You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, world, and welcome to Tales from Hollywood Land, a variable feast of movies, Broadway, showbiz stories, news and gossip, with Julian Schlossberg, Arthur E. Friedman, and Stephen J. Rubin. Today, we look at romantic movies. And now, here's Julian, Arthur, and Steve. Hey, guys. Are you feeling Hi. romantic? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I, first of all, I, I thought this would be a good topic for us because we're in the season of Valentine's Day, which uh, has been an important holiday for many years. When it comes to romantic movies, I know in some quarters they're referred today as chick flicks. I think other people over the years have called them weepies, maybe. And rom-com. Rom-coms. I also, when I was growing up, I referred to these kinds of movies as mush. Because it was all this kissing stuff. And an eight-year-old going to the movies to see The Day the Earth Stood Still and every World War II movie ever made. When it came to these movies, which I would usually get dragged to with my parents, it was just a lot of mush. Well, you see, your title of your memoir could be from mush to mesh. <laughs> no, I think um, Larry Gelbart might have a better time. I mean, that's probably more oriented towards Larry Gelbart. Um, what about you, uh, Arthur? Uh, what was your first exposure to romantic movies? I don't remember a first exposure, but I know I have some favorite uh, rom-coms. Uh, and uh, one of them was 1973, uh, the perfect storm of love stories, at least in my opinion, I say that in a good way, was The Way We Were. Here was a movie that stars Streisand at her peak, uh, Redford at his peak, uh, Sidney Pollack at his peak. They bring in Marvin Hamlish to do the score, along with uh, the Bergmans, Marilyn and Allen. They write the... the uh, classic love song the way we were and it's just something that worked uh i love the movie as i think everybody did it was a big hit uh made for five million dollars grossed in those days 50 million which today would be 385 million dollars not too bad for a rom-com um streisand was never better redford the whole combination worked. she was never she jewish girl he was the ultimate goy, so to speak. Uh, Redford, this great-looking guy, and they and they come together and and fall in love, and then of course lots of other things happen. But uh, that's absolutely one of my favorite movies of all time, let alone favorite love stories. Oh, it's Anybody a terrific! Else? I feel the same way. Arthur yeah. Lawrence, probably his best script that he wrote. I had a funny experience with that movie. I was living with a lovely lady. We had gone to see the movie before it opened uh, because I was a film buyer. And when it came to the scene near the end where they meet in front of the Plaza Theater and Barbara takes out her hand and puts it through Redford's hair, I went. I just started to weep. Okay, so I love the movie. I go home, I don't know, one or two weeks later, I'm uh, at the dining room table and the lady comes in and we're watching television and she sees me weeping and she said, what happened? And I said, they put the commercial on for the way we were and they showed him her putting the hand through the hair and like a Pavlov dog, I started to cry on a commercial just from that little scene. So yes, the way we were meant a lot. Steve, what about you and your mush? What was your first mush? Well, my mother was the one who really introduced me to um, non-science fiction, fantasy, and horror war pictures. She she kind of walked me through what was going on, and she was a sucker for a good romance. And I think one of the first ones I remember was the three girls in Rome on three coins in the fountain. Yeah. I think it was Maggie McNamara. 
And I forget who the other two girls were. I think Louis Jordan's in that movie, too. Well, he wasn't one of the girls. Um, No. Uh, Was Jennifer Jones one of them? I'm not sure. But the the whole concept, it had an impact on me because whenever I go to Rome, I insist on going to the Fountain of Trevi. I have a tendency to kind of respond to movie landmarks, which, of course, have long histories before they became movies. But for me, the Fountain of Trevi was always rather magical. Doesn't Anita Ekberg in the the Fellini movie get uh, with Marcello Mastriani at the Trevi Fountain as well? I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, Anita Ekberg belonged in fountains because she was such a uh, an Aphrodite of characters, or is that Venus? One of those. Yeah. I once I once sat at the fountain, uh, and I had a, a vanilla gelato in one hand and a chocolate gelato in the other hand. And I was eating them both right by the fountain. It was my love affair. Uh, go back to that way we were for a second, Julian. For your information, I was reading uh, about uh, the development, the making of the movie, and Streisand talked about that little putting her hand through his hair. As a, just a little piece of business that she decided something was needed. She didn't know what it was. She tried that and it worked. They, they did it a couple of times in the film. A great yeah. piece of business, by the way. And by the way, it wasn't the Plaza Hotel. It wasn't the Plaza Theater. It was the Plaza Hotel. Uh, Actually, they're right next to each other. Well, that was the Paris, wasn't it? The Paris, you're right. The Plaza yeah. was a block away. You're absolutely but it was, right. They shot it in November, you know, in, in front of the Plaza Hotel. It couldn't have been more perfect. Yes. Uh, one of the things about that movie is they absolutely got away with the whole political thing. So they, they threw yeah. it just in there. There, there was uh, a fight. A lot of people didn't want it in. People, there were studio people trying to get it out, but yeah, they all held firm. Question: yeah. Do you think yeah. they needed it? Did what? Do you think they needed that political thing? Well, I think it certainly showed the difference between her and him. If you needed a real difference, besides. As you said, the religious aspect. Yeah, I think she was a wild liberal, and he wasn't involved politically at all. He couldn't care less about it. He wasn't, yeah. You know who was great in that movie? Vivica Linfors. Yeah, she was. I want to just answer Steve by saying Maggie McNamara, you said Gene Peters and Dorothy McGuire. There you go. There you go. Gene Peters, I think she was involved. Wasn't she involved with Howard Hughes? I want to say. And Audie Murphy. And Audie Murphy. How would you stole her from from Audie because of his money? Everybody was involved with Howard Hughes. And and everybody was involved with with I beg your pardon. I was not involved with Howard Hughes. (laughs) Yes, because I have you I have I have a funny story about that though. Noah Dietrich was known for many years as Howard Hughes's right arm, his right hand man. And I was working at a production company in Hollywood one year. And the phone rangs, and it was Cornell Wilde looking for Noah Dietrich. Now, I had a friend who did impressions, and I was completely convinced that this was not Cornell Wilde. <laughs> I thought it was my friend Jeff. I said, Jeff, come on, stop playing with me. No, 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 this is Cornell Wilde. I had him on the phone for three minutes before he explained to me that he really was Cornell Wilde. By the way, one of my favorite actors of all time. I wish, I, I wish we could interview him, but it might be challenging. My Howard feature. Hughes had a screening room on uh, the Sunset Strip, and I was out there many years ago. We were looking for a film to distribute nationally, and uh, the word was out on the street that there were these two guys coming in with money, and uh, they're looking for a film. And all these films that were not distributed were lined up on Sunset Boulevard. It was unbelievable. Uh, there must have been a thousand cans of film, and we started looking at one after another after another. In those days, you take the reels off; you couldn't stop it otherwise. And uh, it was incredible. We, we couldn't find the film. So we, we took time off. We had some lunch. I, went, I, I talked to the projectionist, who was Howard Hughes' projectionist, little old man. And he started telling me some stories about Howard Hughes in the screening room. He said, this wasn't his screening room. This was his stupping room. He yeah, stupped yeah. like crazy in this room. Over there, Marilyn Monroe, over there, and Sheridan, over there. And he was regaling us with these stories of the stupping. Never found the movie, but got a lot of good stories. Howard Hughes. King was, of Stippers. Was, yes. was that uh, Charles Adikoff, the Adikoff screen? No, no, it's in a different place. Oh. I got oh, yeah. to know Charles Adikoff. He was a legend in Hollywood for his, his screening room. Yeah, he was. And that's what I did when I went to L.A. As Arthur said, we lined up the movies that were, not av- that were available for distribution. 
You know, people go see a movie and they think, what a lousy movie. But someone thought enough to spend the money to distribute it. We, would see, it. Movie, we would see movies that not only wouldn't be released, they, they shouldn't even escape, let alone <laughs> released. So, you know, was anyhow. It you know, the, the, on Rodeo Drive? Uh, yeah, it was, on, it was right near no, Rodeo Drive. But it's no, the I think it was, the, Yeah, I think it was in the ninth. Was it the 9,000 building on Sunset? I don't know. Anyhow. The thing, the concept, is, the concept of romance, which obviously inspires romantic movies, and they don't have to be comedies, by the way, Arthur. They could be romantic dramas as well. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's much comedy in the way we were. Uh, it's really, uh, it's it's a dramatic presentation. But today, the world's so cynical. Uh, the film industry's gotten so cynical that you walk into a studio or a streamer or whoever with a romantic movie, and I don't know if they really know what that is. Well, no. speak, speaking of cynical, that's a wonderful segue for me to talk about, once again, Casablanca. Our lead is a pretty cynical man in Humphrey Bogart, and it's quite a movie. I mean, Casablanca has one of the great love stories of all time and does not have a happy ending, but maybe does have a happy ending depending who you're rooting for. But I'll tell you the, f the part that really always interested me. As we all know, movies are not shot in sequence. This movie, believe it or not, was shot in sequence the first half because that's all they had. They didn't have a script. They did not have a finished script when they started shooting Casablanca. In fact, Bogart complained because, it, you know, after the, they got the first half done, they were writing at night, the Epstein brothers and Howard Cott, to get them the scenes for the next day. So it, interesting how that turned out to be one of the great screenplays and one of the great movies of all time. You know, the film won the Academy Award for Best uh, Picture, as did Michael Curtiz, the director. Uh, and it's interesting to note that when the picture won, Hal Wallace was the head of production of Warner's. He had shepherded this movie from a little short story on and on. He had done everything. He had traded Olivia de Havilland to David Selznick to get Ingrid Bergman. That's how he got Ingrid Bergman. She was under license to Selznick. Did he, did he also get a player to be named later? I, I think he may have. <laughs> no, he did not. But what is interesting on that, I think, is that when the Academy Award won, when it was the best picture won, Hal Wallace started to get up. Jack Warner, who ran the studio, got up, ran up, took the statue. When H Wallace tried to get up, other Warner Brothers, brothers and people stopped him from getting up, and he quit in a couple of months. He left because just of that. And he said, after 40 years, he's still angry about the fact that he, who had, who, Warner, who had nothing to do with it except financing it, took the credit for it that night. He should have gotten up on that stage and slapped Jack Warner. Well, well it took a lot of more years for that. And uh, <laughs> Casablanca true. is one of the couple of handfuls of movies that are a perfect film. Yeah, to uh, me. Yeah, it's a perfect film. Uh, it may not have been as they were making it, but when, when they finished editing and put it together, it was a perfect movie. Well, there aren't too many of those. If you know, even what we, we love them, we hate them, we don't love them. There are very few perfect films. There's usually parts of even the great movies that, eh, you know, Casablanca was perfect. Uh, well, it, it does have, be, it becomes kind of a bit of a running gag in. Um, when Harry Met Sally, which is one of my favorite romantic films, because uh, Billy Crystal's character, Harry Burns, uh, always asks the question, who, you know, what, how, how could she even think of ending up with Paul Henry when she's had the most torrid love affair with Humphrey Bogart? And it becomes a point of controversy between him and the Sally Albright, Albright character created by the luminous meg ryan and i have to say that um that movie the it's all you know the, the success of a romantic com a romantic movie is always the 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 relationship between the two leads that that uh, charisma or or that connection or that the chemistry and there's great chemistry 
between Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan. Don't you agree? Yes. Oh, absolutely. You know, Rob Rhino, who directed it, was breaking up with Penny Marshall. They had been married for 10 years when this came to pass. And Nora Ephron, who came in, actually sat down and interviewed Rob Reiner for the Harry, to help her with writing Harry. Nora didn't need any help for Sally. She was Sally, as were some of her friends. But Harry came from uh, often from, from Rob. And, of course, Billy Crystal had plenty to contribute as well. And Meg Ryan, apparently, it was Meg Ryan who suggested that she turn a dialogue scene into a demonstration scene when she does the orgasm in the restaurant scene, which I think was voted the number 45th most famous line when Estelle Reiner, Rob's mother, says, I'll have... What he's happy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, that's what I've always can, I've always said that uh, and believed that every really good movie has some special moments and that some of these special moments become iconic. That's certainly one of them. Uh, the, when she, she faked that orgasm, it was fantastic. And the punchline to it was perfect, of course. You know, the is still right in line. Uh, but great movies have these perfect things is an example in an affair to remember one of the all-time great romance stories uh i'm talking about the one that was made in 1956 or 57 uh there was it was a terrific movie a great love affair uh, between Cary grant and deborah carr but the iconic moment of that film takes place at the end when he realizes that she is paralyzed and walks into that room and closes his eyes when he sees the picture on the wall. Uh, that is one of those dozen or so, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, of the iconic scenes uh, where no, there's no words. He just looks and, boy, if you don't cry there, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's almost impossible. Another one is, I guess, it, it could be a love story, it's many different things. It's the best years of our lives when Myrna Loy is standing in the kitchen and she realizes that her husband has come home. Uh, again, that's one of those scenes. Do you guys have any other scenes that you that, that come to mind that just have such impact? In, well, in you know, they we've all been brought up on the expression opposites attract, and we sit through Vivian Lee and Clark Gable going back and forth with love. He's in love, then she becomes in love. But the iconic line, of course, we all know is the last line. Frankly, don't, I don't give a damn, as we know. So, yeah, uh, I think there. It's, it's funny the way lines remain with you. I mean, certainly he is looking at you from from Casablanca. That supposedly came that Bogart supposedly said that to Ingrid Bergman with the hairdresser and the makeup person in a four-handed card game. <laughs> And it was Ingrid's turn. And he said, it's here's looking at you, kid. So who knows? <laughs> who knows how true that is? But that's the story. Well, every, in 1996, every teenage girl in America who plunked down the money to go see the movies absolutely fell in love with the love affair between Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic. And I think Titanic, the core of that movie is their relationship. And uh, I think it, it's very romantic. Obviously, J James Cameron uh, creates one of the most logistically complex movies ever in recreating painstakingly every detail of the sinking of the Titanic. But it doesn't obscure the fact that they want to be together forever. Although I still wonder why Leo couldn't fit on that little board with her. What was going on there? <laughs> well, well, what was going on was the script said he had to die, uh, but the moment in that in that there that, that one of those iconic moments is when they're at the head of the ship or whatever they call it, at the bow I guess, so, and it, he's holding her and uh, he puts his hands out wide and and king uh, of the world, the king of the world. There's that there's that scene now in Doctor Zhivago, uh, one of the all time great love stories. Uh, this, the scene, I would say, is, is there are so many, but David Lean gets that camera at one point right up in 
Omar Sharif's face and you see the eyes with tears starting to well up in the eyes. You guys know what I'm talking about? Sure. You know, I mean, such impact. And, you know, we're going to have a guest soon to do a, a, a show on John Wayne. And in his book, Scott Iman, who wrote the book, The Legend, The Life and Legend of John Wayne, talks about the opening, the first scene in Stagecoach with the sawed off shotgun and how uh, Ford brings that camera into John Wayne's face and how that scene, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, was was just uh, fantastic. And well, he twirls the he twirls the gun, twirls the gun, the big one. Yeah. Mike, what about you? What's your romantic story besides your personal life? Well, of course, you know, my my personal life is always wonderful and everything like that. But no, for me, I always like the movie. It's sometimes known as a Christmas movie, but the movie Love Actually is a very romantic movie. Agree. And it's just the characterizations and all the different stories that tie in together and the chemistry between you know, all the different, you know, from the young kid who has the crush on the star singer who's coming in to sing at the school, um, all the way to the folks who were involved with the porno and they fell in love. <laughs> and it's just, it's just awesome. Or the young man who went to America and everyone, all the women loved his accent. And, you know, it's, there was just so many great scenes in that. It was just, it's just a brilliant movie. Well, Richard Curtis, who direct, wrote and directed that, is an amazing filmmaker. He's, he's British, but he loves America. And there are so many Americanisms in his movies. Um, I'm thinking of Four Weddings and a Funeral, which is very romantic because it's, it focuses eventually on the relationship between Andy McDowell and Hugh Grant. Um, and then he does Notting Hill with Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant. And th- th- between that and, and um, uh, Love Actually, he really has, he's one of the few consistently interesting filmmakers that still believes in romance. Although his latest films aren't really about romance. He did that movie called Yesterday about the the musician who suddenly one day wakes up and he's the only one who knows who the Beatles is on the entire planet. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's an amazing movie. It's yeah, a wonderful movie. film. So it's, it's very underrated. Not a lot of people have seen it, but it is, it's so well done. And the chemistry between the lead in that one and the actress is just great. Was it called great. Yesterday? It's called Yesterday. Yesterday. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it. absolutely, and it's uh, it kind of almost is a little bit of a Twilight Zone, uh, you know, setup because there's a worldwide blackout, and all of a sudden things have suddenly changed. Not only is there nobody knows who the Beatles is, nobody's ever heard of a cigarette. Huh. <laughs> I was in Sam Goody's, which was a record store that some of you must know, certainly Arthur does, mm-hmm. and there were these young girls going through. In those days, albums. You just kind of go through the album to see what you want. And one of the girls yelled to the other three girls, Oh, my God, Paul was in a group before Wings. Oh. <laughs> so that kind of made you feel, or at least me, pretty old at that point. Uh, you know? fa- fa- fame is fleeting. I want to talk about uh, the great love stories of certainly the 1950s. I'm sure the 1940s as well certainly 1950s into the 1960s, one of the things they had in common, they had great songs, great musical pieces by the greatest songwriters, the Julie Steins, uh, the Sammy Fains. So I bring up a movie called Love is a Many Splendid Thing, which was a perfect love story. Uh, William Holden, Jennifer Jones, she's a doctor. Uh, she's Eurasian. Uh, Bill Holden is a, is a newspaper writer and there's a war going on that he, he, he may get, and they fall in love and they hit that song. Every time the theme of that song comes on the screen, it just works. I think it was shot in Cinemascope, but it was widescreen. Uh, and, um, it, it was a great love story, but it was, it was just had some really nice things going for it. One of the funny things about the movie is that Jennifer Jones had, uh, her aunt and uncle who were Chinese 
living on an island off of wherever they were. And the, the dialogue was anything that anybody would say to these two people who were wonderful, older people, learned, and just nice people. But every time you'd say something, the, her grandfather, her uncle, whoever it was, would say, you'd say, oh, the sun is shining. And he would say, but the sun works in ways of the world. And it was, everything was, it was a payoff to, to whatever you said. If you walk a mile, you get a camel. Or, you know, it was always a saying. Uh, and it, it wasn't funny to most people. It was funny to me. But uh, I think that's one something of those, that, that, that Saturday Night Live could do great with, you know. One of those characters, I believe, was Richard Liu. And Richard Liu has a reputation of always playing these sadistic Japanese army <laughs> officers Did in they every call war movie. Pockets? Yes. Well, you know, in, in all the war movies in World War II, the Japanese were portrayed by Chinese because the Japanese had been rounded up. They couldn't be in the movies. They exactly. were being portrayed by Chinese people. Moonstruck, guys, Moonstruck. Our dear friend Norman Jewison passed away. It directed probably, in my opinion, probably one of his great movies. And uh, here's a movie that Cher proved to be, as she did in Silkwood, to be a terrific actress. And what a fun film that is between the triangle of Danny Aiello and Nicolas Cage and Cher in between. Plus Olympia Dukakis and Vinnie Gardenia is a terrific movie. Great comedy besides a great romance. It's generally, you don't get both generally. You may have a romantic comedy, but one really beats the other. In this film, for me, the romance and the comedy are fighting it out for the best. I think they're both terrific. Film did, under Arthur's rules of uh, grosses, the film did $122 million and was made for $15 million. Now, that is what you call great, a great word, Great word of mouth movie. And I can make the case that Vincent Gardenia stole the movie. That's how great he was in that picture, as was Olympia Dukakis. Yeah, and Olympia uh, won the Academy Award as well. Speaking of deceased creators, we recently lost a great screenwriter of the 70s and earlier, Herman Rauscher, who wrote The Summer, Summer of 42. 42, which is a, an amazingly romantic movie because of the relationship with this young kid and the Jennifer O'Neill character who uh, was astonishingly beautiful. And uh, I, I think that's one of the great romantic films of the 70s. And uh, once again, as Arthur points out, it's often the music that makes the movie. And Michelle Legrand's score for that movie is yeah. so romantic. Ba -da -da -dum, ba -da -da -dum, ba -da -da. What a great, great song. And directed by Robert Mulligan from the Bronx, Julian. Yes, Robert Mulligan. I launched it at the Fine Arts Theater, and I was very happy with the success of it because I remember at the time the boss said, gee, there's really nobody in this movie. I said, yeah, but it's a hell of a movie. And that one, believe me, we all have had our mistakes, but that one was not one was of Gary my Grimes Was Gary Grimes the kid, Steve? Yes, yeah. he was. Gary he was. Grimes the kid. And then technically, in addition to being a romantic movie, that's what we call a coming of age movie. Oh, uh, was it ever? So many, oh. so many young men. I was one of them, just uh, learning all about women at the time, and uh, certainly enjoying that experience. Um, what do you guys think about Shakespeare and love? Uh, Shakespeare and love. The core of that movie is the relationship between the two leads. And often the core of all these romantic movies generally is just that, wouldn't you say, Steve? Yes. I yeah. mean, Gw Gwyneth Paltrow and Joseph Fiennes have a terrific connection in that movie. Uh, I I was such a big Saving Private Ryan fan that year. That was the the competition for Best Picture between really the two movies were fighting it out it was Shakespeare in Love versus Saving Private Ryan. But I've come to really love Shakespeare in Love over the years. I think it's a brilliant movie. And Gwyneth Paltrow is just marvelous. I think she won the Oscar that year, I think. And would you have voted for it as Best Picture? I would not have voted it for the Best Picture, but I understand why it won. Of course, the I won't mention the filmmaker or the producer who was behind its Oscar campaign, but he was known at throwing literally millions of dollars into buying those votes. 
wasn't well, wasn't Saving Private Ryan really the greatest picture of that year? I think so. I think so. Wouldn't call it a love story, though. So let's jump on to the older man and the younger woman. That's always an interesting theme in our society and in the world. And in charade between Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn, it's a great mystery, thriller, romance. It's got everything. And comedy. Cary Grant didn't want to do it because of the age difference. And he insisted that Stanley Donnan and Peter Stone write it in, that he says, I'm too old for you. He wanted it to be absolutely made plain that he knew it. (laughs) And he wanted the audience to know it. But on the other hand, look at a musical called Gigi. Now, there's an example of a very young girl and a much older man. And he can't believe he's fallen in love with her. He actually cannot believe that he's fallen in love with Wasn't Gigi. that My Fair Lady as well? Well, I guess so. I guess so. Yes, that's a good one, too. Yeah. And uh, so it's good. It's those kind of things where they depict what happens in society and make it really good. That is younger, older does work. Of course, they went a little too far with Harold and Maud, but yeah. that's a whole other story. Well, I had uh, in the, if you go back to Charade and the musical part, there's Henry Mancini yeah. uh, with Charade. Talk about great songs. Yeah. Uh, every one of these pictures in those days had great songs. Today, they don't even call them musical. They, they call them sound design. If you look at a movie, you hear hammering and you hear, you hear, you hear sirens and you hear all kinds of things, but there's no music. There's no great songs from, from the movies anymore. I don't know why. But uh, there's still great composers. It's, it's true. It's true. The Oscar category for best song used to be a real battle because you knew all the songs. And now they pick songs out of movies that aren't even musical. And I've never heard of these songs. Although this year, there's going to be a couple songs from Barbie, one of which was uh, written by her, uh, Billie Eilish and her brother and probably will win the song. Um, well, speaking of... of just musicals and romantic is there anything more romantic than the way vincent minnelli shot uh an american in paris uh an american in paris is like a poem to the relationship between gene kelly and leslie caron and they have that long ballet sequence which uh goes on i think for eight or ten minutes it's true. Yeah. It, it does. But it also has some of the great Gershwin songs, if I'm not, uh, I think I'm right about that. They right? are, of course, they wouldn't hurt. Are you kidding? Yeah, that's. That really now, look, look what Woody Allen did with the Manhattan. He used the whole whole score was Gershwin. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Right. And Woody, black, white Woody's, background. Woody's done some pretty romantic movies. Of course, his uh, pen, uh, not his penultimate, his ultimate was Annie Hall. I mean, that movie is all about romance, although more about the pitfalls of romance than the enjoyment of it. It's true, but you do have a relatively happy ending, you know, so that's pretty good. Relatively happy. I'll give you you a a movie that uh, comes from 1956 that stands up, guys. I saw it recently. Stands up with Tyrone Power, Kim Novak, and a girl named Victoria Shaw, Shepard Strudwick, movie was the Eddie Dushin story. Um, yeah. Guaranteed, if you took a girl to a date to see the Eddie Dushin story, you were home free. Uh, <laughs> it was one of the does great that mean, romances. Does that mean she paid for the cab? Yeah, no, it, it means exactly what, I, what you know it means. But uh, you'd walk out crying, and it was just, it was a great tearjerker, but a great movie, so well done. Uh, Tyrone Powers, you know, at his best, and... Uh, Kim Novak could not have been better. They, uh, he's, uh, he's a great pianist. Uh, and the story takes place a lot in the Grand Central Park in New York. Uh, Tavern on the Green. Uh, but a wonderful romantic film with great, great music. And a father-son situation that, uh, that scene, uh, I trust if you all saw it, if you didn't, there's a scene where, where he's dying, Eddie Deutsch is dying at the end, Tyrone Power. And he, his son plays piano. He's a pianist, and his son plays piano. And they they play two pianos opposite each other. His son's twelve years old. Oh, what is you talk about a scene? Sure thing for crying. Uh, so five Kleenex boxes. So I have I have two 
offbeat films that were romantic in a, I think, offbeat way. One would be Groundhog's Day, which uh, where Bill Murray eventually gets Andy McDowell, but he has to keep doing it over and over again, learning more and more about her to make her attractive to him. Uh, it was a really good movie. I think uh, a terrific a comedy and a and a real romance as well. Did you pick? Did you pick that one, Julian? Because Puxatawney Phil looked out the other day because it was Groundhog Day. It's happening right as we speak. It's amazing. I hear we're going to have an early spring this year because of Puxatawney Phil. And he he by the way he refused to come on the show. <laughs> He's not the right, only, only one, so it's okay. You mean he joins other people, Mike, in that particular thing? All right. The other one that I think is offbeat would be Good Will Hunting. Great movie. Uh, a terrific film where a re- it's a love story in its own way between Matt Damon and Robin Williams and what he does with a little janitor who's a brilliant janitor who has had, had no love, and he gets love. It's a very room. I and think there's a girl, romantic. too. The girl. She- yep. Yep. So anyhow, those were offbeat romances for me, but I, I both of them got to me in different ways. You guys have any offbeat ones that you want to talk well, about? I, you know, it's an epic movie, but it is a bit of an offbeat movie. Uh, the English Patient, mm-hmm. which uh, spans years and flashbacks, but uh, the relationship between Rafe Fiennes and the wonderful actress who played the lead, who I'm forgetting her name. I'll keep talking, Julian. Maybe you'll look it up. Uh, I'll look it up. You keep talking. I'll keep talking. But The English Patient is a very, a, once again, a very romantic movie. I believe the filmmaker was Anthony, the late Anthony Minghella. And he just wrote a poem to romance with a very unusual leading character, by which is of course Ray Fiennes telling his story in flashback while he's he's in that bed in Italy. We have Kristen Scott Thomas and Juliet Binoche. Binoche. There you go. There you yeah. go. I, I know that Juliet Binoche is in the World War II era, and then Kristen Scott Thomas is pre-war, and um, just a, just a beautifully romantic movie in in, in so many ways. The other movie that comes to mind, you mentioned, uh, we mentioned Rome earlier, and of course, The Fountain of Trevi being kind of the focal point of Love is a Many Splendored Thing. And oh, no, excuse me, three, three Coins in the Fountain. Roman Holiday, Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck. There, There's a movie with a lot of romance in it. Great movie. And Audrey Hepburn, who was relatively unknown at that time, what a what a a role that just turned her into an instant movie star. Oh my god, Audrey Hepburn. Hard not to love Audrey Hepburn. You don't I don't think Audrey you can Hepburn. have a, this conversation without mentioning Out of Africa. Sure. Robert yeah. Redford, Meryl Streep. Uh talk about a haymaker of a love story. Wow. Um I mean Redford for many years, if you wanted to do something with romance, you put a woman with Redford because he uh he he well, he brought the chops definitely. In fact, I remember um, it's a little later in his career where he does Indecent Proposal, where it's Demi Moore and uh, Woody Harrelson are the, really the romantic couple, but Redford kind of looms in, and that 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 I thought was a pretty romantic movie. A terrific too. movie, a excellent movie. Yeah, I ha- I had a relationship with Redford for over two movies. River and Servant and Quiz Show. So I got to know Bob pretty good. And I have to tell you that every now and then we go out to lunch on Montana Avenue. And the reaction of people who saw Redford, the waitress as an example, was, you know, things like she'd look at me and, you know, what are you having? I'll have a club sandwich and look at, look at Redford and say, oh, my God. You know, <laughs> he was not a normal kind of celebrity uh, and lived lived a lot of what I saw through back doors and side streets and all you know to, to protect that but you know it's interesting. perfect love story guy i mean of, go ahead okay. Steve. one of the films we have to mention which absolutely went through the roof box office wise was ghost 
Wow. Yeah. I mean, they have Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore. I mean, this was something. And of course, the famous uh, molding scene, we'll call it that, uh, was quite, quite something. How about Dirty uh, Dancing? Dirty Dancing, too. And the other one that made, uh, Arthur, you'll remember this, it, it made the biggest splash was Love Story. And whether yeah. you liked it or not, you cannot get away from the fact that it was one of the largest grossing movies, if not the largest one that year. Wouldn't you say, Off? Yes. 1970. I think uh, it, the, the big movies that year were Love Story, Patton, and Airport. I would say that I would take umbrance with the fact that they say um, love is never having to say you're sorry. Well, you better say you're sorry, or you're going to be out of love pretty fast. You oh better boy. learn to say you're sorry. Oh That's boy. what I found, anyhow. Uh, love story. Love story was a phenomenon, and uh, it had the book, which uh, was it. Peter Bart, or who was it who decided to get that book out before the movie? It was either Bart or Evans, or one of them. One of them, yes. Yeah, or your blondes, maybe, maybe, maybe. Could but be. they got they got the book out. They decided to put the book out before the movie. And and when I say put it out, so if the movie was Christmas, that book was out at Thanksgiving, and it became a, a runaway bestseller and set up the, the whole situation. But the vast majority of of moviegoers when it initially opened were women. Women just loved loved uh, loved that movie, loved the story, and and uh, and it was uh, known as the Three Handkerchief Movie. People Absolutely, yeah. a, tr a true out. weepy, a true weepy. Yeah, it really now, was. Another one of my favorites is Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour in Somewhere in Time, which is uh, written by Richard Matheson, who was a terrific writer on so many things, wrote a number of the great Twilight Zone episodes. This is kind of like a Twilight Zone episode. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of this or seen this movie, Basically, Christopher Reeve is a modern guy who falls in love with a painting or a photograph of, of Jane Seymour from the 1880s. And suddenly he finds himself on Mackinac Island in Michigan, where the real actress played by Jane Seymour is. And I, I thought it was marvelously romantic. The music by John Barry is off the charts. The filmmakers didn't think they could get Barry. But Jane Seymour was a friend of John Barry's and convinced him to do the score for a reduced price. And that's become a classic score. John Barry also did the music for uh, Out of Africa. So he's he's known for doing some beautifully romantic music. Yeah, and there's that musical link again. Uh, it can only help. There was a, a, a not a, a big movie, but a little movie with a great score. Marvin Hamlish again called Ice Castles. Uh, also a beautiful love story. Do you guys remember that? Oh, that yeah. about ice skating? Yeah. 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 Melissa, Melissa Manchester recorded the, uh, the, the song, the uh, Ice Castle being a big hit. Uh, that's Lynn Holly Johnson and Robbie Benson, maybe? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, you got, you also, we have to remember on a song that was gigantic, I Will Always Love You, Bodyguard. Bodyguard. Yeah, oh, written by, God. written, written by Dolly Parton. The song, yes. The song was written by Dolly Parton. Uh, but my God, and there's another example like Love Story, whether you like the movie or not, you can't uh, deny the success of that film. Huge, just huge numbers. It's the biggest, that's the biggest album in the history of, uh, of uh, movies, uh, Julian. I think biggest, they sold biggest, 40 million biggest, albums, yes, from Body was, was it bigger than Saturday Night uh, Fever? and The biggest of all time to this day, I believe. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bodyguard. Whitney Houston. Um, what other films do you guys uh, remember? Steve, you had a whole list, you said. Well, um, uh, this is now 13 years ago, which seems like it was yesterday. You know, some, some of the most interesting romantic movies are wondering how far somebody will go to achieve love. And in the case of a movie called The Adjustment Bureau... Matt Damon and Emily Blunt are star-crossed lovers, but they keep being separated by this crazy organization that follows people around and makes sure they don't do the right, wrong things at the wrong time. And it's, it's, a, it's a crazy movie, 
But the relationship between Damon and Blunt is just off the charts. You guys have seen it, right? The Adjustment Bureau? I have not. No. Nor have I. Nor have I. Mike? You, Say you something, gotta Mike. You talk, Mike. You can't just nod. Know, this is not television. Head, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I saw that years ago. And it's interesting because, you know, basically the story was that, you know, everything has their moment. And if somebody meets too soon, it means that their relationship won't go the way that it's supposed to go. And it was just, it was an interesting story and a neat premise. You guys see a movie called Notebook? Notebook? Yeah, I've never seen the notebook. That's based on that from that author who who does a lot of those kinds of movies. Well, I was just going to go back to if I could just go back to what Steve was saying about not being suited for each other and trying to get together. I don't think you can get better than the last couple of scenes in The Graduate when <laughs> <laughs> Dustin is banging, banging on the church walls on the church glass. Hey! stop that (laughs) stop that wedding and uh in a way i mean it's certainly a romance first with mrs robinson and then with miss robinson so quite something going back to to the notebook author that you were talking about yes uh, it's considered one of the great romances i i never got to see it though Uh, terrific fantastic movie for what it was ryan gosling james garner uh, I believe it was, uh, oh boy, it may have been Gina Rowlands, maybe. Am I right? But Notebook is a great, great movie. Not that far away. Maybe 2004, 20 yeah. years ago. But uh, it's a great I'll give you one, guys. A, a great movie that didn't do much business. And I loved it. And it was the musical version of Goodbye, Mr. Chips with uh, Peter O'Toole and Petula Clark. Yes. Mm. Music by Leslie Brickus and I believe Anthony Newley. Anthony Newley. Certainly, yeah. certainly Leslie Brickus. Mm-hmm. I've got uh, two for you so far that none of, none of you guys have brought up. First off, of course, is Sleepless in Seattle. Of course. Yeah. Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. Yes. A wonderful, wonderful story. And, you know, it's so ad- almost adorable that, you know, it's, but it's, it's a, it's a wonderful, great story and that people can relate to. It's one of those things everyone will be like, oh, that's so sweet, after they see it. Is this the first time th- th- in the show that we mentioned Sleepless in Seattle? Yeah, I should brought do it the up top yet. of the list. Yeah. Yes. yes. Wow, yeah. what an overlook. And they also did a, You've Got Mail, which wasn't so great, but it was great. It was a great little movie, great love, love story, uh, well made. Yeah. The I next Nancy one Myers that I have, from. you might not consider a love story, but I do, is Defending Your Life with Albert Brooks. And oh, I love that's a great love story. And Mer- yeah. oh, I love that movie. And we got what a great a supporting cast. Rip Torn, never been funnier in a movie. Oh, he was wonderful in that. Yeah. And uh, um, Lee Grant. And, and uh, Lee Grant as the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the proposing process of darkness. Yes. <laughs> Notebook, uh, had, Notebook had Rachel McAdams, author. Rachel McAdams, yes. Yeah. Young yeah. girl. But I think there was somebody who played opposite James Garner, and that may, it might have, may been, have been. It may have been Jenna. It may Jenna have been Rowan, Jenna. Yeah. yeah. Well, here, here's a title which actually has some romance in the title: "True Romance," which is a <laughs> Quentin Tarantino script, directed by the terrific late filmmaker Tony Scott, and uh, it's. Uh, it, I thought that that movie had a lot of. Of course, it's a very violent movie as well. But the core relationship between um, uh, the two leads, and of course, I'm blanking on the two leads all of a sudden. Um, Patricia Arquette. And Christian Slater. Christian Slater. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, well, I was going uh, to say that one of the movies that we haven't mentioned was Warren Beatty's first movie. And with Natalie Wood called Splendor in the Grass. Mm-hmm. And another very romantic movie. And uh, I remember seeing it and being surprised that Aaliyah Kazan had directed it. This was not what he generally did, these kind of movies, but it was really something. His He then married a girl from that movie named Barbara Loden, who was quite a beautiful actress who uh, made a terrific film called Wanda, which very few people have ever seen, but it was terrific. Now, who married Barbara? Was it uh, Aaliyah Kazan, Kazan or Brady? Kazan. Oh, no, Kazan. Kazan. Okay. No, Warren never, Warren never married until Annette. 
He lived with a lot of ladies, but not until Annette did he marry. Another Annette. romantic film of that period would have been uh, uh, Steve McQueen and Faye Dunaway in the Thomas Crown Affair, which has the kind of, it has a sim scene similar to Ghost. It, you, you take a, a pottery and you move it to chess. <laughs> chess, chess all, of a, all of a sudden is very sexy. Uh, well, I call it a love story, but nonetheless, yeah. Well, Good if film. you want to talk about uh, chess and whatever, got to talk about the eating scene in Tom Jones. Now, there's a sexy <laughs> <Yes>. scene. <laughs> Has Tom Cruise made an out-and-out -out love story? That's a good question. What, what I would say yeah. is, the, and I'm not trying to be funny, the film with Dustin. That was a love Rain story. Man. Yes. Rain Man. Yes. yes. Rain that, Man. that brings up the question of a, a subcategory called bromance. And, of course, if you're going to talk about bromance, you've got to talk about break a uh, broke back mountain right and, we, and we've seen a whole subgenre of gay and lesbian dramas that are very romantic in their own way well there there is one there is a tom cruise love story tom cruise renee zellweger and the jerry mcguire jerry mcguire show me yeah. the money yeah <laughs> no yeah you had me on the first whatever well how about but look at the scene Again, these moment, these these scenes of a moment when they when they meet on the porch, uh, you know, and uh, they start hugging and kissing and all that stuff. That was great. And also the scene when he says, "You had me," or she says, "You had me at hello." Uh, on the first precious. Hello, yeah. that was precious. Well, Al Alfred Hitchcock wasn't necessarily known as a romanticist, but you could argue that Vertigo, the relationship between Jimmy Stewart and Kim Novak. Is pretty palpable and very poetic. Well, he I would argue with that, but that's okay. Well, he certainly had the hots for uh, yeah. for both of them. <laughs> and what about Annette Benning and Michael Douglas in the American President? Another Rob Reiner, wonderful film. movie, great movie. Oh yes, absolutely. That's a really good one. Yeah, this, and we haven't mentioned it's a wonderful life as a love story. <laughs> hmm. As a well, love story. How about Bugsy, guys, as a love story? Annette Benning and Warren Beatty. Now, Warren Beatty, up until the time he met Annette Benning, was basically a slut. You would agree, everybody? I mean, you know, <laughs> in a nice well, way. I think in the most... hats off to him for doing that. Uh, or, or there was many more things than the hat that came off. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, yes. That, that, too, was a love story of sorts, yeah? Yes, it was. It, it absolutely was. What about Up in the Air? What would you guys say about Up in the Air? Now, that was more of a frustrating love story for George Clooney. Well, he fell in love, and what happened at the end? I think, didn't he get the girl or not? No, 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 no. no. We can't, uh, we can't so, say he did. So Vera walked away from him, eh? <laughs> Julian, what about all the great... Betty Davis love stories. Weren't yeah. there some great, great pictures there? Isn't the classic considered now Voyager with the, the cigarette lighting? Isn't sure. that considered yeah. very and, romantic? And Mildred Pierce in its own way with Joan Crawford. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's any lack of love stories in the movies. That's for sure. But I think the ones that the four of us seem to be pushing towards are more romantic comedies than anything else. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Isn't it sad, though, that Groucho Marx never got to be in a love story? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you go, go, go back to a bro, bromance with the bros. <laughs> the bros. Well, yeah. he did He did romance Margaret Dumont in a number of pictures, but, <laughs> but it wasn't quite the classic romance. Um, I'll give you a great love story that's blended with a sports movie, and that's called Pride of the Yankees. Gary Cooper. And Teresa Wright. Teresa yeah. Wright. Beautiful That's love story. That's right. It's true. Well, there's a great British one. A guy you remember called Brief Encounter with Trevor Howard, Celia Johnson, and considered in England probably one of the great love stories. I, and, that's a great movie. Yeah. They needed a train station or something? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and they break up and they get together. It's a real sad, a real weeper, but very, very uh, effective film. I think I'd have to look it up. I think David Lean may have made it too. I think he may that have. That's not right. 
More recently, we had La La Land, which is pretty romantic, although frustrating at times. Well, I, 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 having loved Singing in the Rain and Gigi, La La Land is so far down on my list. <laughs> I, I like musicals that people can sing and dance in. Oh, well, well, wouldn't we say that La La Land maybe was a bit overrated? Come on. <laughs> yeah. I think the reason it got so much attention is it was if they hadn't made that kind of movie in forever. It's just like Barbie. Barbie, uh, when was the last time women and daughters could go to a movie that they really wanted to see? You know, if you think about the fare that's being offered by Hollywood these days, it seems like 90% of the movies are big science fiction epics and Marvel movies. And they throw in some depressing dramas at the end of the year. But where's the audience? You know, these romantic movies we've been talking about for the last hour were, a, were part of a core audience item for a huge number of women, particularly, who flock to the movies every year. And they brought their husbands and boyfriends. And the romantic genre was a very palpable genre, just like comedy was a very palpable genre. And I've been yammering for months that comedies have disappeared. And for most cases, romantic movies have disappeared. Yes, off, Offbeat Stories is Mel Brooks, apart from the 2,000-year-old man. Carl Ryan is interviewing him. He's, he's, the, he's uh, Sigmund Freud. He's, he's a great, great psychiatrist. And, and Ryan says to him, sir, did you ever... Ever, what is what is this? Do you ever cure anybody? You know, do you ever really cure anybody? He said, "Well, there was this, there was this man, there was this uh, man and his dog." He said, well, "But what, a lot of people love their dogs." He said, "No, this guy really loved his dog." You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we've come we've come to the point in the show where we want to thank our fans for joining us once again. If you like our show, please subscribe because we. We love our subscribers. We we also want to tell you that we are available on all the podcasts now. In fact, we now have a YouTube channel, which we are going to get you information on. Uh, we're on Apple and Amazon and Spotify. Um, we have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram page. But this is also the time in the show where each of us can tout what we're working on that could uh, that is important as well. And I would like to invite people to watch my own podcast, which is called Stephen J. Rubin Saturday Night at the Movies. And uh, some of our upcoming guests include Joe Medjuk, the producer of Ghostbusters, which this year is celebrating its 40th anniversary. And I'm very excited to have Joe on the call, call of the show, which will be our 100th show. And although we aren't there yet, I have a feeling we will be having a hundredth show in the in the future as well. What about you, Julian? I hope we have a hundred show. Oh, you want my things? Okay. Uh, well, I have a new podcast called Julian Schlossberg's Movie Talk, and uh, as they say, it's on uh, Audible and Spotify and wherever the hell you want to get a podcast. And the first couple of people were F. Murray Abraham, and then we had Richard Benjamin, Marlo Thomas. And we have a whole bunch of others coming up soon, including Ben Mankiewicz from TCM. So that's kind of nice. And uh, my my book, the audio book that I wrote, Try Not to Hold It Against Me, is now available for the first time. I I read it, so we'll see if anybody wants to hear me read it. How about you, Arth? I'm satisfied just plugging Tales from Hollywood Land. It's a great oh. show. The show's coming along. It's being successful. A lot, lots of people are tuning in. We're very happy about that. And we would love to hear from you with uh, if you have emails or suggestions or thoughts. Uh, we would like to, uh, to to hear from you. Uh, and uh, Julian, is there is there a, a, an email address that they can, uh, Steve, is an email address that they get to? Absolutely. And you, we also are constantly looking for interesting co-hosts who bring an interesting perspective to a topic. So if there's a certain topic you want to talk about, which... We all agree is a good one. You can uh, email us at talesfromhollywoodland at gmail.com. And even if you have comments, good or bad, we take criticism very well because we work in show business. If you can't take criticism, we're in trouble. How about you, Mike? What do you got going that we want to hear? Oh, of course. I always talk about different stuff on my podcast I have a podcast called Earth Station Who, which is a Doctor Who themed podcast. And we review everything of the 60 year history of the TV show Doctor Who. 
and it's pretty awesome stuff. My other podcast, Earth Station One, right now is on hiatus, and we'll know, we'll find out later if it's going to come back. And I have a couple other projects in the works that it will be telling you about soon. I hope. Now tell me, a Doctor Who still have the Daleks? Of course they do. That's like you know saying you know Santa doesn't have Christmas presents or rain. Just wanted to know because I didn't know it was just I always knew it as Doctor Who and the Daleks. Of course. <laughs> And to all of our our listeners and viewers, we wish you a happy uh, Valentine's Day season. If you have a romance, we hope it blooms. And if you don't have a romance, we hope it blooms too. Everyone these days could use a little support, and your friends at the ESO Network are no different with the ESO Network Patreon. The cool thing is, is when you help support us, it's you who will benefit. With four tiers starting for as little as 25 cents a week, you can listen to some of your favorite network podcasts early, hear exclusive content, maybe get some ESO swag, or even possibly take a shot at the geek seat. All you need to do is sign up at patreon.com backslash ESO Network. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.